So to end our discussion of clock tree synthesis, I just wanted to mention one additional subject that is clock domain crossing or CDC. So most system on chips have several components that communicate, communicate with different external interfaces and run on different clock frequencies. In other words, they have multiple asynchronous clock domains. Okay. It's very important to understand that asynchronous clock domains cannot communicate with each other in a straightforward fashion. So just as an example here, we have two flip-flops. One's running on clock A and the other one's running on clock B. And we have this um, node in the middle called DA. And what we have here is clock A is running at this frequency, clock B is running at a different frequency. And there's some phase difference between where we decided the starting point uh, was, which causes a phase difference between each and every clock edge of these two, uh, two clocks. And that phase difference can be arbitrary because these are completely asynchronous. So in the case uh, of DA changing here, so DA rose over here, and anyway, it fell at this point. And it fell due to the rising edge of clock A. When clock A went up, we had D go over to DA, and this was this falling edge over here. And that was fine, but it happened to be that DA fell exactly when clock B was rising. That means we had a uh, setup violation, and due to the setup violation, we had some metastability here, and DB did some sort of a weird uh, type of a metastable state until it finally settled at one of the stages somewhere along the clock cycle. That is something that we don't want to happen, this type of a metastability state. So our problems with CDC are several. And the main one when we're passing data between asynchronous domain is this metastability um, type of uh, effect. Uh, so a setup or hold violation in the capture register can occur, and it may cause high propagation delay at the fan out, high current flow in the chip because we have some sort of a median state that causes short circuit current, and different values of the signal at different parts of the fan out. Um, so this is really strange. It's something that's completely non-digital. It's something that we don't want. Um, let us just make some definitions over here on the side and quickly go over some of the math. You can go in, for example, the CMOS DL VLSI design. It has a more uh, deeper dive into the math here. But we have something called TW, which is an error window. That's the setup plus hold kind of a, of a window around the clock edge where we're going to get an error if we have some sort of change. Then we have the clock frequency F and the frequency of the data change, which we call F of D. Okay, so now assume that a data D change can come anywhere in the clock cycle relative the capture clock. So the rate of metastability is F times FD times the timing window. And with a 1 gigahertz clock and an 0.1 um, uh, times the frequency probability of data changing or frequency of data changing and a timing window 20 picoseconds, we get a rate of metastability of 2 million times a second. Well, that sounds like a, quite a lot of uh, metastable um, points inside our chip. Okay, um, that's not the only problem. Metastability is one problem, but the other two problems basically that we're going to look at are data loss. So new data in the source may be generated without the data being captured at the de destination because we have different frequencies and they're not uh, synchronized with each other. And similarly, we can have data in co coherency where the data may be captured late, causing several coherent signals to be in different states. And that's a very strange situation. So we can have different data running around and get us totally unsynchronized with our um, state machines and our, our different timing paths. Okay, so the first and basic solution is called a synchronizer. And a synchronizer is a real simple solution which is used all over the place on clock, clock uh, domain pa uh, crossing paths. And it's just a, a two flip-flops that are cascaded with each other and they're both co connected to the capture clock. So you see the clock B is, con is connected to this like simple two register shift register over here. And how that helps is that when our DA, our middle signal here, um, changes, it may be um, captured uh, in a violation state and get to a metastable point over here on this internal node of our synchronizer. But um, this is going to dissipate pretty quick. Remember, we have this regenerative property of CMOS type of circuits. So this is going to be, even if we get to a metastable state, it's going to quickly go up to one or down to zero. And as long as it does it, less than a one cycle time uh, in less than one cycle time, it'll usually be much faster than that, then the second um, clock uh, edge is going to sample either a one or a zero. It may be not um, coherent with what's going on here, but at least it'll be a, uh, a, a real digital signal. 
Okay. There is, however, a probability that the signal will not settle within the cycle time. It may take more than t amount of time to settle, and then we will have our metastable um, situation over here, which is something that we don't want. So uh, how do we see that? So the probability of metastability um, at this point will be p of t larger than s uh, equals e to the minus s over tau, with uh, tau a certain parameter of the flip-flop. And we want the metastability to dissipate at least t set up before uh, the next clock edge. So uh, failure rate is the metastability uh, times the exit criterion, which will be the TW, the window width, divided by the clock frequency, times e to the power of T minus T setup over tau. Um, so what we usually uh, de describe this is, is some sort of mean time between failures, or MTBF, which uh, is some sort of parameter that says how much of this probability of metastability are we um, uh, willing to sacrifice, and that will tell us if we have to add, for example, a third flip-flop or maybe even more than that into our synchronizer. And so MTBF is usually 1 divided by the rate of failure, and in this case it comes out about 10 to the 24 years, so that's a pretty low mean time uh, between failures and we'll probably be able to live with it. And therefore, usually um, just a two flip-flop um, synchronizer is used on every clock, uh, clock domain crossing uh, point. But the big question is, our synchronizer is enough? And the obvious answer is that no. So we took care of metastability. We won't have metastability. But the other two problems that I mentioned, data loss and data inc incoherence, are still obviously there. That is something that we need to design our logic to take care of. So we need to make sure that it will take at least two clock cycles or, or something like that to have the data pass between um, the two domains. Um, to eliminate data loss, usually we have to look at if we're going from a slow clock to a fast clock or a fast clock to a slow clock, or the two clocks are equal and uh, are equal frequency. So when we go from a slow to a fast clock, we won't usually use any data because we'll be sampling several times within uh, one change of data on the slow clock. But when we go from a fast clock to a slow clock, we're going to have to hold the source data for several cycles to make sure it reaches the other side uh, on time to be used. For data coherence, we need a, a lot more thinking. That's uh, to just make sure that everything is really happening um, uh, coherently uh, along the chip. And usually that's going to uh, take us to different asynchronous in interfaces. So one of the things is uh, handshake protocols where we ask the other side if it's ready, if it's received the data, if it knows what's going on before we actually remove the data and put on a new piece of data. Or a, a, a very common way to use it is a FIFO interface where we have some sort of an asynchronous FIFO and it gets a, a different clock on each side. One of the clock writes into the FIFO, the other clock reads out of the FIFO, and therefore we don't have any clock domain crossings directly. They all go through this buffer. Um, other solutions are using gray code multiplexers, and there are different ways to do it. Uh, it's a big subject, and, it's, uh, not, and I'm not going to go into it any further in this course. So that was basically the end of our discussion of clock tree synthesis and clocking in general. And here are a bunch of um, uh, references that I use, and you're very much encouraged to go and look further into this.